I'm gonna keep it real with you. I'm working on my own creature collector based off of STEM topics, and I've shared quite a few designs so far. I probably shouldn't really talk about a really strong design at the end of my decks, but I think I have other surprises in store whenever I do finish the game in a distant future, so I'll talk about that one design today. But before that, I guess it wouldn't hurt to talk about a similar archetype in Pokemon that fans have dubbed the Pseudo-Legendary. Alright, so what is a pseudo? Pseudo means fake, so we're talking about fake legends, and somehow every generation has at least one line that fall in this category. How did this start? Back in generation 1, if you look at the deck's order, which isn't exactly the order you encounter the mons, it's just a rough ballpark for most of them. Anyways, at the end of the decks you got the fossils, snorlax, the obstacle mon, then the legendary trio of birds, and... What's this? There's more? I mean, Mew and Mewtwo sound reasonable as they are mythicals and legends themselves. But who is this line? Dratini is hard to get in Generation 1. You either had to grind the casino or go into the safari. You never saw it spawn regularly otherwise. So what's the hype around this worm anyways? Whoa! Is that a d dragon type? Seriously, in Generation 1, there was never a dragon type up till now. And what's that? The last Elite Four member, spoilers by the way, is dragon themed? And they have the evolutions of Dratini? What a special mon. Now, they aren't treated as straight up legends like lore wise. Heck, if we're going by lore, even Arcanine was mentioned to look legendary. But the Dratini line certainly has that special surprise factor. Just need to fully evolve it and level them up to. level. level 55? As a reference, not only is this the highest level requirement in Generation 1, but it remains as one of the highest level requirements in the franchise. This thickums makes you seriously work for it. And I think that's the main philosophy of Pseudo Legends. It's a line you really want to work towards, as you are rewarded with a pretty strong mod. But how strong, you ask? That's a great question. Starting with Dragonite and all the way up to the Pseudo we see in Generation 9, the total base stats are all the same. In fact, Japanese fans call this set the 600 Club, as they all have the total base stat of 600. And why is that? Well, in Gen 1, Dragonite technically only had a total base stat of 500, and that can be explained by how Gen 1 only had 5 kind of stats, unlike the 6 that we're familiar with today. Dragonite seems to be balanced around having an average of 100 points per stat. Now it's not only hundreds across the board, but it kind of sends the message that on average, a hundred for each stat should feel pretty high. Haha, <laughs> what do you mean there's power creep? But seriously, I think that's the reason why this rule is so heavily enforced in this franchise. There's actually other non-legendary mons that also exceed 600 base stats, but they usually have a requirement or some detriment added to them to balance them out. But the total base stat for this archetype won't exceed 600, which, by the way, is a pretty high total base stat. Higher than most other legendaries, like the Kanto Birds, which have 580. It's why this archetype is called Pseudo Legendary, because stat wise, they can go toe to toe with some of the lore centric special mons. But say you wanted to make a mon of this archetype, well, then I'll have to tell you that stats aren't everything in making a mon. Here. We still got a lot of generations to talk about, so let's continue this conversation as we talk about Tyranitar. Ooh, beat Godzilla. Uh, they're Godzilla, right? Is it another kaiju? Well, they're a kaiju at least. They kind of go through the stages of complete metamorphosis from a larva, a pupa, to an adult. I talked more on that in my early route video. But yeah, that's cute and all, but... We're in a conversation about what actually goes into making these mods, because yes, you want them to be worthwhile, but if you make them too strong, the game might get stale after getting a pseudo legend on your team, because again, those total base stats are actually really high. So how are these pseudo legendaries kept in place? Types. Both Dragonite and Tyranitar have a type combo that is 4 times weak to a specific type. For Titar, heck, Rock Dark type is one of the worst combos ever. 
Ah! But dark type was a new strong type in this generation to counter the previously dominating psychic. Alright, so pseudos take a long time to fully train because they got a beefy 600 stat points, but since that's too strong, they got terrible typing. Ah. Well, enter generation 3. Ruby and Sapphire brought a new element into franchise that I really, really appreciate. Abilities. Each species now has one to three kinds of abilities that bring a certain condition when they are in play. So now when you encounter a Mon, you can't just think what types they are weak to and what stats they are good or weak in. Now when you see some Mons, you gotta think what abilities they could have and change your game plan to work around that. It might sound like a lot to keep track of all of it, but... It's like a Cuphead boss, right? As you play the games from gen to gen, they expect you to be more familiar with how one mechanic works and build on from there. And it's not that every ability is pertinent to every situation anyways. Now let's talk about power creep. Power creep is... understandable? Inevitable? I don't know. But for a series game like Pokemon, where you can bring past mons into the new games, you gotta have a selling point to pick up some of the new designs. But you don't want to make the power jump too high that it totally disconnects the audience. This is just the third generation so far. Let them cook with this new ability concept. Because Hoenn didn't forget about how the past pseudo-legendaries are supposed to feel pretty strong. So they gave them some abilities that would boost the usefulness of those past mons. Dragonite got Inner Focus in Gen 3, which protects them from flinches. Okay, it's not the most useful ability. I guess being Dragon-type was already good enough for now. But in Gen 5, they would get the more iconic multi-scale, which halves the damage taken when they're at full HP. And Tyranitar, the baby with all the weaknesses in the world, was given Sandstream, which sets up a sandstorm that hurts everyone at the end of the turn. Except for certain types. The weather can trigger all sorts of other abilities and change other moves that can dramatically change how the battle is played out. Psst, by the way, Sandstorm changed in Gen 4 to only last a few turns, but in turn they buff Rock-type special defense by 50%, effectively giving Tyranitar even more defenses. Tyranitar as a Sandstorm setter remains popular even decades later. Look at these pseudo-legendary chunk guy getting out there, living their life. But wait, we're in generation 3 right now, and that's 1, 2... Bruh, I haven't even talked about this generation pseudo. Salamence is a salamander? who weirdly goes through complete metamorphosis. That's cute. But they're dragon flying just like Dragonite. So what makes Salamence different? Stat-wise, they're a bit more optimized towards their offenses than Dragonite. But Salamis got Intimidate, which is more supportive, as it lowers the opponent's attack to allow for some setup or let the rest of your team manage with the opponent better. And way later in Generation 5, they will get Moxie. The Moxie raises Salamis' attack after every KO they make, making them a nasty snowballing sweeper. Dang, you just gotta love abilities, man. I know there's a lot of other games that do this by allowing you to have different kind of loadouts, different deck builds, but dang, to bring this to this genre of RPG, I don't know, it just brings so much character behind each design. But hold up, there's another pseudo-legendary in Generation 3. That's right, there are two lines that slowly evolve into a 600 base stat total in this generation. But this isn't a situation where you could only get one or the other in a single playthrough. The two lines aren't necessarily side grades of each other because you could get both Salamence and Metagross by yourself. The catch is, you could only get a more defensive Metagross in the post game. Honestly, this is kind of ingenious as it encourages you to keep playing and exploring after you beat the champion. Pokemon never repeated this again, which is understandable because if everyone is 600 BST, no one- I mean, they would feel a lot less special and not uniquely powerful, but I wouldn't be surprised if we see multiple pseudos in a future generation. Of all the champion teams, Cynthia's is probably the most popular. She has a lot of scarily bulky mons, but her ace is often depicted as Garchomp, the pseudo-legendary landshark of Sinnoh. 
gotta find a way to make them worthwhile so they slightly outspeed Salamence base stat wise. Of course in practice you can train every mod to be slightly better at a specific stat. This just means that the fastest Garchomp would be faster than the fastest Salamence. Now, when I was drawing this guy on my Twitch stream at twitch.tv slash Nordist, I remember some people talking about Gabite looking too similar to Garchomp, which is, I mean, they got similar poses, and it's hard to realize the different body shape and the head unless you really stop and look at both of them side by side. And that's honestly a legit issue for three stage lines as a whole. How do you make each stage look distinct from each other, especially if you have an intermediate stage? That's probably why we've had complete metamorphosis-like progressions in the other pseudos. So I'll probably go into this more in a separate video, but I'll just say this. If you cover different concepts for each stage, you can most likely make each stage stand out more easily. Garchomp's whole line is just about sharks walking on land, and while Gibble is an adorable little blorb, the intermediate Gabite could feel too close to Garchomp. I don't know, I still like Gabite, but those were just my two cents on three stage line designs. Since Generation 4, Pokemon started to split every one of their moves to count as physical or special damage. Like selecting a Barbarian versus a Mage. It used to be based on the type, but no. Now each move has a type and a type of damage that they inflict. While all these pseudos so far have decent special attack, this generation pseudo legendary is the first one that excels in it. This Ein Zwei Dry Headed Hydra is a dark dragon type. Whoa, what a menace. Really, it takes so many levels just to evolve this guy. What the heck? Why is it so high? Now, People like to mention that there are some other contenders that could probably be counted as a fake legendary just because how they are treated in the game or how they're relevant to the story like other legendaries. But even though this pseudo legendary 600 club title is a fan made term, most people are using it exclusively for this one archetype Pokemon keeps putting in because it appears to be a metric of what a strong Pokemon should feel like. If these pseudos feel underwhelming compared to the rest of the new cast, that might be a sign of severe power creep. Anyways, Hydreigon isn't known for being impossibly underleveled in the last story fight of Gen 5. No, they are known for the change that they would bring upon in the next generation. You know, with all these pseudo legendaries running around, Dragon type became a lot more prevalent. And a problem with that is Dragon type was supposed to be a very strong type, only balanced by how rare they are, with only one line getting it in Generation 1. I made a whole video on this too. Anyways, many, but not all, of these new pseudo legendaries seem to keep having the Dragon type to immediately come out the door as being pretty strong. So Generation 6 added the ultimate counter to dragons, the Fairy type. Not only are fairies super effective against dragons, but you can no longer spam Outrage for a win because dragon moves cannot even touch fairies. In fact, fairies also beat dark types, so the edgy Hydreigon just becomes eviscerated by a tiny mouse, which is admittedly pretty funny. So what pseudo did Generation 6 have? The new fairy type is pretty strong, so they should be... Oh, it's still a dragon type. It's only a dragon type. You know, fair enough. I think Gudra is a good measure of how strong fairies actually are because at least in this generation, most fairy attacks were special and Gudra has that massive 150 special defense to hold their own ground. Now here's a brief aside about the art of pseudo legendaries. Hmm, yes, art, quite subjective. Hmm. But while a layperson may say that pseudo legendaries are supposed to be edgy and cool, need we remind ourselves of the first generation's huggable Dragon Knight? Now, everyone has their preferences, of course, and I think Gudra widened the door of what could be considered a pseudo legendary. Too many times in the past were the pseudo legendaries the de facto cool, edgy designs, while this franchise found their success because they could balance cute and cool designs in their roster. Some vocal fans may not like the cuter design philosophy of Gudra, but I think people should remember that not every design is gonna be for them. And that's okay. Now, I'm not telling you to like it. Liking each Pokemon doesn't make you a better person. But Pokemon making designs for various people is what makes them a more popular franchise. 
By now, I think we've established that game data can augment a design. It's not necessary, of course, but knowing that behind this piece of art that this guy is a glass cannon or has an ability to change the course of battle gives some personality to the design. If anyone starts racking on the competitive viability of your mod, especially due to the typing, always know that they're floundering on nothing because type alone doesn't make a mod's usability. We talked about how stats and abilities are important so far. If you haven't defined any one of those, that comment has no real reason to criticize you on gameplay viability. Now, some artists might tell you that Psh, it's fine, rules are meant to be broken, art is subjective. And yes, while that is all true, I'm gonna throw in my two cents. If you're not sure on any element, don't write it down. If you're going to assign stats and ability, I'd say it's best to respect the conventions others would expect, which means that you should do some research what's a reasonable stat and ability that would fit. Otherwise, if you don't want to research it, that's totally fine. Just don't outright say the numbers and effects. I'm just talking about avoiding conflict. So that's mainly why I don't write down the numbers in my YouTube videos. Well, the stats are going to change slightly when I make my own game anyways. And most of the abilities I show are from Pokemon, even though I know that when I make my own game in the distant future, they would have different titles and their own effects. But currently, it's just there to give enough character to the artwork. But let's say if you've done your diligent research and some man-child is still complaining. Well, they still don't know the whole picture because there's still a whole nother element that comes into gameplay. The move pull. Finally, we get to talk about Generation 7 pseudo-legendary, Kamo'o, the Komodo Dragon. The stats are a bit on the defensive side, but the fighting dragon typing does leave a lot of weaknesses compared to the pure dragon Gudra. So how do we make this new design still worthwhile? Give it a signature move. This hasn't happened since Dragonite first appeared with a dragon type move in Generation 1. So Kamo'o got clanking scales, which was a special attack move and it fits right into Generation 7's gimmick, which was all about moves anyway. You do a funny Fortnite dance and unleash one super move per battle, called Z-Move. Z-Moves amplify the power of the move or adds an additional effect for status moves, and some special moves by special species can wield a special Z-Crystal that adds other additional effects to the move. And Kamo'o here is actually one of the recipients of these special Z-Moves. In future generations, these gimmicks wouldn't exist anymore. But in the next generation, they at least gave Kamo'o another signature move that references their Z-move days. Up till now, most of the pseudo legendaries have been pretty cool in their art, right? Like if we're going to call them cute or cool, many of them hit the latter. But what if it's not an either or situation? Could a design be both cool and cute? I don't know. It, this is all subjective anyways, but dang do I love Dragapult, Generation 8 pseudo-legendary. It's a Diplocolis back from the dead to fire out their babies like missiles. Coincidentally or not, every new pseudo starting with Kamo'o was given a signature move. I can only guess it's to make the new addition still feel worth having without breaking the 600 stat limit. This stealth bomber is incredibly fast as their stats are more optimized to be a glass cannon. How fun. Wait, 8.5? The heck does that mean? Well, this is one of the rare instances where a new Pokemon design was introduced in a spin-off game rather than in the main series. Legends Arceus introduced like a good dozen of new designs, most of them being variants of older mods, and one of the variants happened to be of Gudra. Hisuian Gudra is even physically tankier than the one from Generation 6 as they got a steel shell now. They got an adorable animation where they go in their shell with their signature move, shelter, and actually Move over, Gudra. Look at this middle stage, Sligu, my beloved. I mean, I already really like Sligu, but it has such a big home now. I want to throw it like a frisbee. Adorable. And here we are to the latest generation we have as of now. Paldea has Bax's caliber as the pseudo legendary, and wow, does it change a lot between their stages. Didn't even need complete metamorphosis this time either. This is Godzilla, right? The number of times I've seen this gift to justify this pinhead is way too high. 
The ice type does make this frail in general, so they tried to make it up with the highest attack stat of all the pseudos. They really min-maxed here with the special attack being super low. People still argue about how good or bad this design is. Everyone has their own tastes, but looking back, I must say that my personal favorite is Dragapult. But these pseudo legendaries have once again been shown to be quite popular, not just competitively, but as icons, as they have been given love once again through paradox forms. There's a special lore based thing in Gen 9, it basically gives like dino or robot versions of select few old mons, and we got three pseudo legendaries that received this form. In fact, back in Generation 6, there was this mega evolution gimmick where certain mons were also chosen to get new forms. And that also had another set of pseudo legendaries. Wow. So this archetype is pretty important, eh? Not only to keep a standard of balancing gameplay, but also giving an iconic design that people like, especially as they would see the design many times in competitive battles and important story beats. So say I wanted to make something like this. A line that's hard to fully evolve, but rewards you with a super strong mon. How would I go around doing something like that? So now I'm trying to make my own game here. Not a fan game because I got some other ideas to mix up the formula. So Stemma is my creature collector based off of STEM topics. And my channel here has went through quite a few designs by now. And additionally, I think it is worthwhile to have a super strong mon to work towards. So I want a concept that's pretty representative of STEM without being so important that it should be a legend or something. So I ended up with a dragon. Now I don't have the dragon type in my own game, as I'm distancing my personal project from Pokemon, but the pun remains, it's a dragon polygon, Dracogon. Polygons are two dimensional shapes, while one dimension would be just a line, two allows for a whole plane of points. I ended up making it a square to represent the two dimensions. I was thinking of making a pure neurotype or pure spectral type, this is based off of mathematical dimensions. Honestly, the typing is pending. I usually put in abilities that I could equate from Pokemon, but now I think I'm gonna give it a signature ability that would be best revealed whenever I finish the game in years. Ugh. Lastly, Dracogon's lineless art is intentionally even flatter than the ones I've drawn for the others, cause it's 2D. Get to level 40 and you got Drachedron, a polyhedron, which are three dimensional shapes. That extra dimension gives it that volume as a cube floating around. So we go from 2D to 3D, and the only other place to go is up to 4 dimensions. While we interact in a spatially 3 dimensional world, having 4 spatial dimensions is harder to represent. Let's try something. You get a point, 0 dimensions. You define an axis, move it across it for a bit, now you got a line, 1 dimension. Draw another axis, this time perpendicular to the previous one. Now you got a square or a rectangle, two dimensions. Let's make things look nice and go with the regular square. Take the square, move it across another perpendicular axis. You get a cube, three dimensions. Now, ideally we'll choose another perpendicular axis, but uh oh, now they all overlap with the past axes. So for now, Let's choose just a random axis, just to see what creating a fourth dimension would look like. And you get a cube going across to another cube. Hmm. We go from a line, to a polygon, to a polyhedron, to a polychoron. That's what four dimensional shapes are called. Now the square equivalent of a polychoron is called the tesseract. And what we have here is more like a parallelogram of the fourth dimension, right? It's like the slanted version. But another popular depiction of the tesseract is found by folding up a bunch of cubes. If a cube can be made up of squares, a tesseract is made up of a bunch of cubes. But how do you fold up this bad boy? Well, it's hard to do in our world in perception, right? But imagine that you can smush those cubes into a shape that we can force ourselves to understand in our 3D world. And that last one ends up inverting itself to cover the rest of the shape. In the fourth dimension, none of these cubes are actually smushed. But in our 3D spatial world, they look smushed. Just like how squares look to be smushed when they're on the surfaces of a cube. So how did I make a mon based off of 4D? Drake Koran would have this film all around it, but I didn't want the silhouette to just look like one big square, so I figured that it could phase in and out as they're going across the additional spatial dimension that we can't see. Is the fourth dimension actually time, you may ask? Well, 
Yeah, that's a way to look at it. But we're looking at fourth spatial dimension here, which is much harder to visualize. But if we were to force an understanding in our 3D space, we'd imagine it's something like the Tesseract. Let's recap. Pseudo-legendary Pokemon keep popping up in every generation, as they are a benchmark of what a strong mon should be like. How? They do so with their massive 600 total base stat. If they start to appear mid, that's probably a sign of some crazy power creep going on. But I think we'd learn more than just about pseudo-legendaries today. Because in making any mon for a game, the stats don't tell the whole story, as you have to consider typings, abilities, and available moves. If you want to reduce dumb comments talking about competitive viability, just leave any one of those elements blank and you should be free. Visually, pseudo legends have ranged from cool to cute and everything in between. Pseudos had three stages to really make you work for that final evolution. And as it goes for all three stages, having a different body plan or concept in mind can definitely help your middle stage feel like a justified design. But if you haven't learned any of that, I hope you at least learned that you could call a four-dimensional square a tesseract. If you're curious about my STEM-based project, follow the channel. My older videos go over a whole bunch of other designs I made. If you like this video, please let me know as I spent a lot more time to make this video, but I hope it was worth it. In a cruel way, I guess it's like raising to pseudo legendary. You can support me by simply liking and sharing the video, or you could join my Patreon, where I show off some work in progress shots and past designs. Thank you again to all my Patreon supporters. And thank you for watching my video. Have a nice one, and I'll see you around.